I am a girl, and a few years ago, something really scary happened to me because of Facebook. At that time, I had just finished high school. It was summer, and I was living with my mom and dad. I used Facebook sometimes, but not as much as other apps like Snapchat or Instagram. My Facebook and Instagram were connected, so my Instagram posts would also show up on Facebook. I remember not checking Facebook for many weeks. I had turned off notifications because I didn't like getting random messages from Facebook that didn't matter to me, like someone's birthday or similar things. When I finally opened Facebook after a long time, I saw I had missed many notifications. First, there were about five friend requests. I also noticed that my Instagram pictures had been shared on Facebook, getting lots of likes and some comments from friends. I replied to some comments and accepted the friend requests. But then I saw a comment from a man I didn't know. His comment on one of my photos was weird and creepy. He said something like, You're so beautiful. I wish you were mine. It made me feel uncomfortable, especially because the man looked a lot older than me. He had white hair tied back, a bit of a beard, and glasses. I noticed he commented on my other photos too, and those comments were just as unsettling. He even commented on very old posts from years back. When I checked his profile, I realized he wasn't on my friends list, and I didn't remember getting a friend request from him. I deleted all his comments and blocked him. Then I changed my profile settings so only friends could see my information and posts. I felt safer after doing this and thought that would be the last of it. But I was wrong. Just two days later, I was alone at home. My parents were at work, and someone knocked on our front door. I walked to the living room slowly and peeked out the front window. I thought it would be a delivery guy like UPS or Amazon at the door, but instead, there was a man I didn't expect to see. It was the same man who had left creepy comments on my Facebook photos. I was shocked. I had assumed this man lived far away, possibly on the other side of the country. As I watched him from the safety of my living room, he turned his head and saw me. Our eyes met for a second before I turned and ran to my room. I quickly called my mom my voice shaking as I explained the situation. While talking to her, the man knocked on the door again. My mom advised me to call the police if he didn't leave. I peeked out from my room, listening for any sign of him. Hearing nothing, I crept towards the living room, moving as quietly as I could. But as soon as I entered, I saw him outside the front window, staring in. He noticed me, smiled in a way that sent chills down my spine, and waved. Terrified, I ran back to my room and dialed the police, reporting a stalker outside my house. The operator promised that officers would arrive within five to ten minutes. Feeling somewhat safer, I waited, listening for any noise that would indicate he was still there. A couple of minutes passed, and just as I considered checking again, a knock sounded on my bedroom window. I froze, then slowly turned to see him peering in at me. I screamed and fled to the bathroom, locking myself in. I stayed there until I heard a different knock and a voice announcing police at the front door. Cautiously, I left the bathroom and went to let them in. They told me they had caught the man trying to enter through the back door. He was arrested, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me, knowing I wouldn't have to deal with him again. Last year, I badly needed a new laptop. Every day, I used a computer for school and sometimes for work too. It was something very important for my day-to-day -day life. The laptop I owned was old and very slow. I had been saving money for a long time to get a new one. My brother told me to check out Facebook Marketplace, so one night I did just that and looked for laptops. I wanted one that was newer and stronger. After days of looking and doing lots of research, I found one that looked like a great deal. I checked it quickly again and decided it was the right choice for me. Then I messaged the person selling it. The seller got back to me fast. His name was Jack. When I talked to him, he said we could meet the next day in the afternoon, after his work. I told him I was ready to buy the laptop then. As long as it worked well, I would pay him the full price he wanted, which was $800 in cash. I knew this was a lot cheaper than its price in stores, and I thought I was getting a great deal. Jack agreed it was okay, and we planned to meet the next day after his work. There was a small shopping center in my town, and we chose to meet in its parking lot in a quieter spot. It was a place that usually had a lot of people, but we picked a corner of the parking lot that was more silent. 
My brother decided to come with me so I wasn't by myself, and we drove there right on time at two in the afternoon. I think we arrived a bit early, then we waited. I had told Jack when I was leaving, and he said he was on his way too. When he wasn't there yet, I thought he was just delayed or held up at work. My brother and I stayed in the car, talking while we waited. Time passed, and we began to worry. No one was around us in the quiet part of the parking lot where we planned to meet, and Jack was now over ten minutes late. I messaged Jack, telling him exactly where we were and asked him where he was. We kept waiting, but he didn't reply. Soon, it was almost thirty minutes after we were supposed to meet. Then, I saw that Jack had seen my message, but he didn't answer. Feeling let down, my brother and I decided to leave. My brother guessed maybe Jack realized the laptop was worth more than he asked for, or something like that. We drove back to our house, where we lived with our parents while away from school. Our parents were at work, so it was just the two of us there. But After getting home, I looked on Facebook Marketplace again, but it seemed like Jack had blocked me, and everything was gone. This made me really upset. After that, I started looking for other laptops, trying to start over. I was in my room when suddenly my brother rushed in. He said he heard a noise from the back window, and then saw a man outside. We went out to check, and just as we did, we heard our back door opening. It was only three o'clock, and our parents usually didn't come home until after five, but we were sure it was probably the man my brother saw. We both dashed back into my room and quickly closed the door behind us. We pressed our ears against the door to listen closely. Someone was definitely moving inside our house. My room was at the very end of the hallway, and the person didn't sound too far away. I whispered to my brother, asking him what we should do next. He whispered back that he was going to call the police and took out his phone. But just then, we heard the footsteps coming our way. We tried to be as silent as possible. My brother hadn't managed to dial the police yet because we were scared to make any sound. The stranger slowly walked through the hallway, then into one of the rooms. My brother whispered to me, thinking the person had gone into his room. That's when I thought of something. I whispered urgently that we needed to escape, pointing towards my window. I rushed to it, trying my best to open it quietly. Our house was only one story, so if we could get out, we could run for help. As I opened the window, it made a loud noise. Right at that moment, we heard the person leave my brother's room and start moving down the hall towards mine. I quickly climbed out the window, and my brother followed. Just as he was getting out, I heard my bedroom door swing open. We didn't look back. We ran straight to our neighbor's house across the street. We knew them well and figured it was safe. Thankfully, they were home. We hid in their garage and called the police from there. When the police arrived, the man was still inside our house, hiding in the basement. It turned out to be the same man, Brian, who was supposed to sell me the laptop. He had actually been in the parking lot of the shopping center at the same time as us, just blending in with the other parked cars. Then, he followed us home without us noticing, and tried to break in, probably aiming for the cash I was carrying for the laptop. That's the only reason I could think of for his actions. After this incident, I decided never to use Facebook Marketplace again. I am a 32-year-old man, and I live in the north part of America. This tale is about a frightening experience I had last summer, and it still makes my heart race when I recall it. After my friend left our shared flat, I was stuck with an empty room. Paying the rent alone was too much for me. I had seen people finding roommates on Facebook, so I thought I'd try it too. I put up a post showing the room and wrote a simple description of our place, then I shared it. It didn't take long before people started replying. The first message was from a man named Mark, who said he was interested. He seemed okay, but his way of talking was off. His voice didn't show any feeling, like a machine. I tried not to worry too much. Not everyone is good at talking on the phone. I suggested we meet somewhere public to chat first. But he didn't want to meet and said he preferred to move in straight away. That made me feel very uncomfortable so I decided to look for someone else. Then he sent me a very angry text with mean words and even threats. What happened next was even more terrifying. 
He sent me a photo of a dark gun on a table. I couldn't tell if the gun was really his, or just a picture to scare me. I blocked him and tried to sleep that night. A couple of days later, another message came in. This time from a guy named Alex. He was polite, and we sent a few texts back and forth. Then he suggested we meet at a local cafe to talk about the room. I agreed to meet him at a small cafe in the center of town. When I got there I saw a man sitting by himself, looking around as if he was expecting someone. I approached him and introduced myself. It turned out to be Alex, so I sat down and we started to chat. He talked about where he worked and what he liked to do for fun. He seemed like a regular guy, and I began to relax a bit about the situation. But then, as we talked more, I noticed his voice sounded very familiar. It was the same flat emotionless voice that Mark had on the phone. This made me feel uneasy, thinking that Alex might actually be Mark trying to trick me. So I quickly made up a reason to leave, grabbed my stuff and stood up. But as I was about to walk away, Alex grabbed my arm tightly and said, You won't get away from me that easily. Fear gripped me and I started to panic, but then I remembered I had my phone in my pocket. I managed to get it out with my free hand and called the emergency number. Seeing this, he let go of my arm, and I ran out of the cafe. I stayed on the phone with the operator until the police arrived. Alex was arrested on the spot, and I was left shaking but thankful I was safe. Upon searching him, the police found a gun that looked just like the one Mark had sent me a picture of. I shudder to think what could have happened if I had let him into my home. Thankfully, that never happened, and I escaped the situation unharmed. I still can't understand why he did what he did. Eventually, I found a new roommate through friends, which I believe is much safer than meeting someone online. That's the advice I'd give to anyone now. One day, I checked my account and saw a new message from someone. I often used Facebook for many years. During all this time on Facebook, I got lots of friend requests. I didn't really know most people in my friend list. Usually I got around 5, 10 friend requests every week, and I mostly accepted them without thinking much. The message I got this time seemed like junk. It was just a bunch of links, and these links were super long. There wasn't any text with these links, and I didn't click on them. They were sent by a person who didn't have a profile picture. I thought this person was just sending spam, and maybe I had added him by mistake before. I deleted the message and removed him from my friends. But the next day I got a very similar message. It was from a different person. This one had a profile picture, but it was nothing special. I think it was a sports team's logo. This person also sent me random links. Now I started to think maybe there was a problem with Facebook, and that's why I was getting these spam messages. I just deleted them and didn't think much about it. But the messages didn't stop. The next day I got spam from several different accounts. I was starting to wonder what was happening. Then, the day after that, things got really strange and scary. I received a friend request and the username was John Doe Hates. John Doe is actually my name, and I also got a friend request from someone named John Doe is a Fool. I clicked on these profiles, curious despite myself. They were empty. No friends or posts, like they were made just to scare me. Someone was clearly trying to scare me. I didn't know who it was or why they would do this. I quickly decided not to accept those strange friend requests and took a break from Facebook. I even deleted the app from my phone and didn't check it on my computer. But the weird stuff didn't stop with Facebook. A couple of days were quiet, but then, one night around midnight, there was a knock on my door. Living alone in a small apartment, I was puzzled about who could be visiting so late. I went to the door, but when I looked through the peephole, nobody was there. The same thing happened the next night. A knock, but no one at the door when I checked. The following morning, I found something even more disturbing. Right outside my door, there was a piece of paper lying on the ground. It was a printout of my Facebook profile picture. This scared me more than the knocks. I had no idea what I should do. The final straw came the next night. It was around 11 p.m., and I was getting ready for bed when I heard another knock at my door. This time, right after the knock, I heard the sound of the doorknob turning. My heart raced. Thankfully, my door was locked. I rushed to see who was there, but again, nobody was outside. 
I opened the door cautiously, and what I saw made my stomach turn. There were over a hundred pieces of paper with my profile picture printed on them, all piled up on the floor. I gathered them up and decided it was time to go to the police. I explained everything to the police the next day and filed a report. There wasn't much else I could do. Strangely enough, after I went to the police, everything stopped. No more knocks, no more pictures left outside my door, and no more creepy Facebook messages or friend requests. I still have no idea who was behind it all. This story starts a few years back, in 2018. I was really into using Facebook then, not so much these days. Every day I'd scroll through Facebook on my phone and chat with friends using Messenger. At the time, I was 20 years old and had around 300 friends there, which felt like a lot, even though I knew some people had thousands. One day, I received a friend request from a girl named Lily. We had a few friends in common, about four, and from her profile photo, she seemed friendly. Her profile didn't have much info, just her age, 20, and a couple of photos, showing she had around 150 friends. I didn't recognize her, but since we had mutual friends from my old school, and another person I didn't know well but who lived nearby, I accepted her friend request. Shortly after, Lily messaged me. I opened Messenger and we started chatting. She was easy to talk to and we quickly became friends. After chatting for a week, we decided to meet in person. I knew she lived close by but didn't know her exact address. Lily suggested we meet at a shopping mall close to my place, about a 15 minute drive away. We planned to meet there on Saturday at noon we kept chatting as usual until then. When Saturday came, I drove to the mall and entered. It was crowded, typical for a weekend. I let Lily know I was on my way, and she said she was too. Upon arriving, I messaged her I was inside, but then she stopped answering. At first, she said she was already in the mall looking for me, but after I told her my exact location, she went silent. I waited in the food court for about 15 minutes, but no sign of her. I messaged her again, noticing she had seen my message but didn't reply. After waiting a bit more without any sign of her, I started to feel uneasy and began walking around the mall to find her, thinking maybe her phone signal was bad, or she was too busy to reply. But as I wandered through the crowded mall, a sinking feeling grew inside me. The mall was large, and finding someone in it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. The mall wasn't huge, but it was big enough with two floors and lots of shops. It was filled with people, making it hard but not impossible to find someone. While searching, I noticed a man staring at me from a distance. As I moved through the mall, I saw him again, trailing behind me. I wandered for about half an hour, hoping to meet Lily, but deep down, I started feeling she might not actually be there. Then my phone buzzed. It was a message from Lily saying, meet me at the food court entrance. I was puzzled because I had already been there and told her so. I headed back taking a few minutes to get there. The place was still packed, but there was no sign of Lily. Approaching the entrance, I spotted the man I had seen earlier. He was loitering near the doors, scanning the crowd. Our eyes met briefly before he hid behind a door. Feeling uneasy, I decided to leave, but chose a different exit to avoid him. As I walked away, he started following me through the food court. I quickened my pace, turned a corner, and finally reached an exit. Once outside, I circled the mall to get to my car without seeing the man again, and drove home. At home, I found another message from Lily. Why didn't you come to the food court entrance as I asked? Why did you leave? By then, it was clear to me that Lily might not be real, and that the man could be behind her account. I challenged her to send a real-time photo of herself, instead she blocked me. This confirmed my doubts. I was disappointed, but relieved I hadn't fallen into a worse situation. This experience taught me to be much more cautious with people I meet online. The thought of being watched and followed in the mall by someone with bad intentions was chilling. From then on, I made sure to verify the identity of anyone I planned to meet from the internet. I was bored, just looking through what my friends shared and checking out news online. I felt like checking something new so I decided to look at the buy and sell section to see if there was anything interesting for sale. Once, I had bought a phone from an online marketplace, and it was a good deal, so I thought why not see what's available now? There were the usual things. Cars, phones, 
computers, and some other stuff no one really needs. Then, my eyes caught an ad for a free television. This TV seemed pretty new, and I was actually thinking about getting one for my room, so I clicked on the ad to learn more. I wanted to find out if there was something wrong with the TV, which made it free, or if it was in perfect condition. The ad showed it was a 50-inch TV. The photos showed it standing in a room with carpet, and there was a photo of it turned on, proving it worked. The seller, now called Anna, mentioned she was moving and didn't want to take the TV with her, but assured it worked perfectly. The ad had been posted just an hour ago. I quickly sent a message asking if the TV was still there and said I could come get it as soon as she allowed. About 10 minutes later, Anna replied, saying the TV was available and I could pick it up the next night. We agreed on 8 p.m. I was thrilled about the TV, thinking it was worth a lot and I had been wanting one anyway. The following day I sent a message to Anna to make sure everything was still okay and she said to just message her when I arrived and she would open the door for me. I spent my day at work, went home for a bit, and then set off to pick up the TV from Anna's place. Anna's message earlier had been friendly, making me feel at ease. I typed her address into my phone and followed the map. It was a short drive, only about 10 to 15 minutes from my place. The neighborhood looked normal, a bit removed from the hustle of the city, with houses spread out, each sitting on a decent-sized piece of land. Then, I turned onto a street ending in a dead-end sign. This was it. The road ended at a narrow driveway, which my phone told me was Anna's. The driveway led to a garage separate from the house, with an old pickup truck parked out front. I drove down the driveway, thinking it would be easier to load the TV. After parking, I quickly messaged Anna to let her know I had arrived. She replied right away, inviting me to come in and mentioning the TV was in the living room, waiting. Stepping out of my car, I noticed how dark it was, with no lights on in the house. It felt odd, but I shrugged it off and walked to the front door, finding it unlocked. Inside, it was pitch black. I fumbled for a light switch, eventually using my phone's flashlight to find one. The light that came on was weak, barely illuminating the old dusty living room. No TV in sight. Feeling uneasy, I moved further inside, exploring a bit. There was a kitchen that looked normal enough, a hallway leading to the back, another living area, and stairs going up and down. The TV was nowhere. The house's quiet and eerie vibe was getting to me. I messaged Anna again, asking about the TV and double-checking the address. Waiting for her reply, the silence of the house felt heavy, making me want to leave. Then, Anna's message came through. She confirmed the address was right and added, Sorry, I'm at the upstairs living area. When Anna told me to take the stairs in the living room, I felt something was off. Why didn't she meet me herself? Why wait until now to tell me to come upstairs? Despite my doubts, I moved towards the stairs. Just then, I heard footsteps outside, heading to the front door. The screen door opened, and then the front door, which I hadn't closed properly, was shut. I caught a glimpse of an arm. It looked like a man's, but not the person attached to it. Right after that, I heard someone coming up from the basement. I didn't head upstairs. Instead, I made my way to the back of the house, feeling a chill run down my spine. Seeing the back door, I didn't hesitate. I ran out into the night. The backyard was wild, with tall grass and trees. I ran through, eventually finding myself in the neighbor's yards, making my way back to the street while avoiding the house. From a safe distance, I could see my car still in Anna's driveway. My heart sank. I knew I had to get back to it. Checking my phone, I saw several messages from Anna, urging me to come back, questioning why I left. Ignoring the dread, I made my way back to my car as quietly as possible. Reaching the driveway, everything seemed eerily quiet. I sprinted to my car only to find the windshield smashed, glass everywhere. As I drove away, a quick glance at the house revealed a man watching me from a window, an unsettling smile on his face. Back home, I reported the incident and the account named Anna. I couldn't shake the feeling that Anna might have been a cover for the man in the house, part of some dangerous trap. What exactly was happening in that house remains a mystery, but one thing was clear. I was lucky to escape unharmed. A few years back, 
I decided to sell my old car through Facebook Marketplace. I had just gotten a new job, and with it, a new car, so it felt like the right time to let the old one go. Before, I usually bought and sold cars on Craigslist, but this time, based on a friend's suggestion, I chose Facebook Marketplace because it seemed simpler. The car I was selling was a 2014 Chevy Cruze. I wanted $8,000 for it, which I thought was a fair price after checking around. I expected some people to offer less than what I asked, and I was okay with that, as long as it wasn't too much less. At first, not many people seemed interested. Only one person asked if the car was still up for grabs, but then they disappeared after I said yes. Another person offered me just $1,000, which was way too low. I ignored them, but they kept messaging me, begging me to at least consider their offer. In the end, I had to block them because they were wasting my time. After a couple of days with no real interest, I finally got a message from someone serious. A guy named Dave contacted me, saying he'd pay the full $8,000 and wanted to see the car that very night. I was really happy about this and agreed to meet him. We decided to meet in the back of a Walmart parking lot that night. I cleaned the car, hoping to sell it. Dave told me he was on his way and soon after, I saw an old black car pull up next to mine. A man got out introducing himself as Dave. He was a skinny guy, about 5'9", wearing old jeans and a hoodie, and he looked to be in his 30s. He said he liked the car and was ready to buy it right away. Dave agreed to take the car for a test drive. He sat in the driver's seat and I took the passengers. We drove around the block and then Dave parked the car back in the Walmart lot. He seemed happy with it and told me he'd buy it, saying he had the cash in his car. It was chilly, so when he suggested we sit in his car to stay warm while he got the money, I agreed. Inside his car, Dave reached into the side compartment of his door and pulled out a big bunch of cash. But when he handed it to me, it was only $1.800. I thought he was joking at first, but his face was dead serious. Then he confessed he had messaged me before with a different account, offering $1,000. He was desperate for my car and said I could either take the $1.800 or he'd take the car himself. That's when I realized he still had my car keys. I argued, saying I needed at least $7,000, but Dave wouldn't budge from his $800 offer. When I asked for my keys back, he ignored me, locked the doors, put his car in drive, and started moving. He warned me not to try anything, claiming he was dangerous, and then drove onto the freeway, demanding my phone with threats of driving into oncoming traffic. I had no choice but to give it to him. Eventually, he exited the freeway, drove down a deserted road, and ordered me out of the car. Left alone without my phone or car keys, I walked in the cold until I found a small gas station where I could call the police. They took me back to the Walmart, but my car was gone. I reported everything and got a ride home. My car was never found, but thankfully I had insurance. I just hoped the police would catch that guy. My name is Jack, and this scary thing happened to me a few years back when I was still in college. Back then, I was in my third year, learning how to run businesses. I had spent my first two college years at a small college and had just moved to a bigger university. I was both excited and nervous as I packed up my things to go to my new place. I was going to live with some people I didn't know yet who I found through a Facebook group. I didn't really know much about them before I got there, and living alone was too expensive for me. But when I got to the house, I liked it right away. It was an old but charming house close to campus. It wasn't fancy, but it was much better than a small dorm room. Walking in, I could hear people laughing and talking from the living room. I followed the noise and met my new housemates. There was Chris, a tall guy who was very friendly and studying to be an engineer. Then there was Joe, a bit smaller, but very funny, who was studying psychology. And there was Tom, who was quiet and focused on his computer science studies. They all made me feel welcome. I found out I wasn't the only new guy. Chris and Joe had also just moved in, while Tom had been there before. The first couple of weeks were awesome. We got along well, spending our days going to class and studying. At night, we'd make dinner together and watch movies. It felt like I had found a new family, which was really nice. But then things started to get weird. Chris, Joe, and I were getting along great, but Tom began to keep to himself more and more. It was rare to even see him. 
He'd stay in his room all day, only coming out quickly to get food or go to the bathroom. I'm not even sure he was going to his classes anymore. He also started to get really short-tempered, getting mad at anyone who tried to talk to him or check if he was okay. I started to be really afraid of him and tried to stay away as much as I could. This made me feel a bit better, but his strange actions were still freaking me out. Around that time, I noticed that things in my room didn't look right. I always keep my room clean and everything in its place, so it was obvious when my computer or clothes were moved. I didn't want to believe someone was going into my room without permission, so I just tried to ignore it. But then, one night, I was trying to sleep when I heard a strange noise from the hallway. I got out of bed to check and was shocked to see Tom just standing there, outside my door. He had a weird, scary look on his face. Then I saw he was holding a small knife. He didn't open it, but it was still terrifying. Suddenly, he moved towards me fast and I screamed for help, falling backward. I tripped over something and hit my head hard on something else. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a hospital where they told me Tom had tried to hurt me really badly. The doctors said I was lucky it wasn't worse. At first, I couldn't believe it. But as I remembered more, I had to accept it was true. They told me Chris heard me and managed to stop Tom and hold him until the police came. I found out Tom was taken by the police. I had to leave college and go home to get better, both in my body and my head. It's been a tough journey, but I'm starting to feel a bit better now. Looking back, I realized there were signs something was wrong, but I didn't want to think a friend could do something so horrible. It was a tough lesson, but one I'll never forget. I've learned that sometimes people we think we know can do terrible things. I went back to college in a new city and met new people to live with. I was scared at first, but my new housemates turned out to be really nice and became my good friends. I'm thankful for them and for having another chance at college. I still have bad dreams about what happened, but I'm trying to deal with my fear and keep going. This story is about a scary event that happened to me. Now I am 28 years old, but this occurred roughly five years back. The whole thing began when I decided to sell my laptop on Facebook Marketplace. The laptop was a good one, only a year old and still in great shape. I thought someone would be happy to buy it at a decent price. I was going through some hard financial times, but I don't want to go into those details. That's the reason I chose to sell it and stick with my old laptop for a bit longer. Someone messaged me showing interest in buying it. They offered a bit more money than I was asking for. Looking back, that should have warned me, but I overlooked it. I really needed the cash, so I went for it. We agreed to meet in a grocery store parking lot not far from where I lived. I was happy about the chance to sell the laptop quickly. I grabbed my phone and left my apartment, walking towards the parking lot. It was a nice summer evening around 7 p.m. The sun was getting low, and I knew it would be dark soon. I hoped to finish the deal before nightfall. Reaching the parking lot, I saw a few people around the store, but didn't pay much attention to them. My focus was on spotting the buyer to get the sale done. After a bit, I noticed a guy standing by a car in a distant part of the lot. I headed his way with my laptop. As I approached, he signaled to me, showing he was the one. He was a tall, strong-looking guy with a beard that needed shaving and a serious face. A feeling of worry hit me, but I tried to shake it off. I was there to sell my computer, after all. I showed him the laptop. He asked about how well it worked and its features, then wanted me to unlock it to check if it really worked. Then I gave him the laptop, and he handed me the money. While I was counting it, he suddenly grabbed my wrist hard and twisted my arm back. I yelled because it hurt a lot and tried to get away, but he was much stronger. He then took out a knife from his pocket and put it close to my neck. Don't move, he said in a low voice. Just give back the money and pretend this never happened. I was so scared. I had never faced something like this and didn't know how to react. I quickly gave him the money back and he stepped back but still had the knife out. His face showed no feeling. It seemed like he did this kind of thing all the time and it was normal for him. Then he ran off. I just stood there watching him go and couldn't believe what just happened. I realized he had stolen from me. It was hard to believe. My hands were shaking and my heart was beating fast as I took out my phone to call the cops. They got there in a little while, 
and I described the man and said he ran away. They said they would try to find him, but that didn't make me feel much better. The rest of the day, I felt lost and confused, as if it wasn't real. I went back to my place but couldn't keep still. I walked around, trying to understand the situation. I was mad, frightened, and felt very upset. I had never felt so weak and exposed. The cops never found the man who took my things. My laptop was gone for good. And of course, his profile was nowhere to be found later. Thinking back, I realize I could have checked his profile to see if he was real. That's a good thing about selling on Facebook Marketplace compared to other places like Craigslist. You can look at their profiles and avoid the dangerous ones. I didn't do that, and this is what happened. This all happened around eight years ago, back when I was just hitting my mid-twenties. One day, while wasting time on Facebook, I stumbled upon a friend request from someone I didn't know at all. Their profile picture was nothing but a shadow. Their name didn't ring any bells for me. Normally I wouldn't add strangers, but something about this person sparked my curiosity. So I accepted their request and we began to talk. This person, who went by the name Jake, was easy to talk to and seemed nice in the beginning. He was curious about what I did and what I liked. We found out we both really liked music. I started to enjoy our talks a lot and looked forward to them. Jake seemed to really care about what I had to say, which made me like talking to him even more. But then, things started to get weird when Jake began asking very personal questions. He wanted to know exactly where I lived, what my daily routine was, and he even made comments on my pictures and what I posted. I began to feel uneasy and thought it was best to stop talking to him. That's when things got really scary. Jake wouldn't stop messaging me, day and night, wondering why I wasn't answering. When I ignored him, his messages got creepier, and he even mentioned the cafe where I worked, a detail I was sure I had never shared with him. I became really scared and thought I should go to the police for help, but they told me there wasn't much they could do since all our interactions were online, and there was no way to tell if Jake was even in the same country as me. I felt trapped and scared, not knowing what to do. Then Jake started leaving frightening voicemails and even threatened to come to my home. I was completely terrified and felt like someone was always watching me. This mess all started from connecting with someone I never met face to face. He didn't have a real photo online. Anyone I passed by could have been him, and I wouldn't have a clue. My fear kept growing, and I began to sleep with all the lights on in my room. Every night, I made sure all the doors and windows were locked tight. I couldn't help but look around me all the time. What used to be a normal, happy life turned into days filled with worry and nights filled with dread. Then one day, Jake sent me a message that chilled me to the bone. He said he knew exactly where I was and that I couldn't hide from him. That scared me enough to call the police again, and this time, they actually listened. It seemed like they finally took it seriously when Jake threatened to find me in person. I don't understand why they didn't help me the first time. Later, the police got back to me. They had talked to Jake and warned him to stay away from me. After that warning, Jake stopped messaging me. But the fear he caused stayed with me for a long, long time. I still use Facebook and other social media, but I'm very careful about who I let into my life now. I've learned it's important to listen to your gut feeling. The internet can connect you with great people, but it can also be a place where danger hides. Around four months back, my family and I moved to a new place in the countryside. Before this, we lived in a small flat, meaning we didn't have a garden. So the idea of owning a garden was new to us, and of course we didn't own a lawnmower. To avoid spending $200 on a new lawnmower, especially since we might move again soon, we decided to find someone to cut our grass. At first we used a service recommended by my partner's co-worker, but paying $1.65 every two weeks started to feel expensive. We wanted a cheaper option. That's when we found Alex. Alex had advertised on a local Facebook page that he was available to mow lawns over the weekend. He mentioned he worked for a well-known company, or at least, that's what it seemed. I reached out to him through Facebook. Alex seemed friendly at first. He asked for my address to give me a price quote. After visiting our house, Alex texted, Wow, your porch is huge. His comment made me uncomfortable, but I thought maybe I was just being too sensitive. 
We arranged for him to come by and work on the garden. I told him my days off, but he said it wasn't necessary for me to be there. We decided Wednesday would be good. On Wednesday morning, he messaged, Are you at home? I replied, no. Three hours later, he asked again, Have you come back yet? I said no, and mentioned I'd be back late, after eight. Then Alex told me he had a flat tire and proposed to reschedule for the next day. On Thursday, early in the morning, he texted me again. Will you be at home today? I replied no, and a few hours later, he asked once more if I was home. Again, I answered, no. I had already told him I wouldn't be around the whole day. Will you still make it? I asked. He replied, saying his truck had broken down this time. His messages were getting too personal, like, I hope you're not mad at me, dear. By now, his behavior and constant excuses were making me feel uneasy. Despite my better judgment, I said he could try again the next day. Friday came, and it was actually my day off. I decided to leave the house early and spend the day outside. Out of nowhere, he texts, I'm on my way. You're not working today, right? I replied that I was off, but wouldn't be home. He kept pushing. When will you get back? I told him I wasn't sure. Later, he texts again, apologizing, saying, Sorry, my equipment fell out of my truck and got damaged. I might try again tomorrow, he said after I had clearly had enough. I was deeply unsettled by his behavior and finally told him to forget it, that I'd look for someone else. Saturday rolls around, and after work, I see several messages from him on my phone. He claimed he had mowed the lawn and was demanding payment immediately. I refused to pay until I saw the work myself and suggested transferring the money via a digital app instead. He became angry, insisting on being paid right then. Despite feeling anxious about him possibly waiting at my house, I arranged for a friend to follow me home for safety. Thankfully, he wasn't there. I transferred the money, hoping that would be the end of it. Two months later, the story took a strange turn. While talking to my fiancé, Alex, on my way to class, he mentioned a man walking down our driveway. Later, Alex texted that the man was promoting a lawn service. The name on the business card left behind was the same as the man who had harassed me. I called Alex, who said the man, Charles, had acted surprised to see him and inquired if he lived alone. Charles didn't visit any other houses, just ours, and offered various services, including lawn care and pest removal. Charles's knowledge of our bat problem, which I had posted about on Facebook, alarmed me. Charles was particularly interested in our dog, asking numerous questions about his size and behavior, which Alex thought was just fear of dogs. After giving Charles a brief tour outside, he left. I realized this was the same man who'd been messaging me and told Alex, who became very concerned, especially about the detailed questions Charles asked about our living situation. Charles had pretended not to know us or the house, suggesting he was just passing by to promote his business. The realization that my car was in the driveway making it appear I was home alone was particularly disturbing. I hesitated to involve the police, fearing I might be overreacting. This all happened recently and I'm hoping not to hear from him again. But if anything else happens, I'll be sure to update. A few days ago, I had to take a plane to a small town I've never visited to search for a place to live for my studies. I was traveling alone, but before my trip, I looked up lots of homes on Facebook Marketplace and managed to arrange a few visits. My first visit was scheduled for late in the afternoon in a quiet part of town. The homeowner seemed okay when we emailed and he asked me to call him an hour before we were supposed to meet to confirm my arrival. So, I did just that. I called him an hour ahead, but he didn't pick up. I decided to walk to the house anyway, hoping the homeowner would be there by the time I arrived. About an hour later, the man called back. He asked if I was still on my way, and I told him, yes, I'm almost there, just five minutes away. But his response was surprising. He was angry, saying I shouldn't be there for another hour. That's when I realized he was right. My old phone at the time didn't update the time automatically when I moved across time zones. I forgot to set it myself and realized I was an hour early. I tried to explain the mix-up over the phone, but the man was really angry. I understand I made a mistake, but his reaction seemed excessive for such a small issue. I offered to wait outside until the correct time, but he quickly said no, almost like he didn't want me there at all. This made me feel uneasy but I needed a place to stay badly. 
I decided to kill some time at a nearby food place until it was time for the visit. When it was time, I went to meet the homeowner. He was around 50 and looked very unkempt. His clothes were partly ripped, and he seemed like he hadn't cleaned himself in days. I felt uncomfortable and wanted to leave, but finding a place to live was crucial, and there weren't many options available, so I stayed. While we were talking about the house, I noticed a younger man leave through a back door. This guy looked even shadier than the homeowner, glanced at us, ran to his car, and drove off fast. This made me very worried. I asked the homeowner who the man was, and he said it was just another person he had shown the house to earlier. The man started asking me lots of strange questions. They were not the usual questions someone renting out a house would ask. He asked about my age and what I was studying. All the while he looked straight into my eyes without blinking once. I answered his questions, but I tried to not give away too much. Then we went inside the house. From the outside, the house looked okay. But once we entered, it was clear it wasn't well kept. I followed him as we checked each room. Whenever I asked about the house's poor condition, he dodged the question, saying it was just not finished yet. After we had seen the inside, he said he wanted to show me a shed in the backyard. Before I could respond, he led me out back, away from any nearby streets to a separate shed. He opened the shed door, revealing stairs leading down into complete darkness. He tried to turn on a light, but nothing happened. Instead of reacting, he just started walking down into the dark as if he expected the light not to work. Standing at the bottom of the stairs in the dark, he looked up and asked, Aren't you coming down? I didn't answer, shocked that he expected me to follow him into this dark separate basement. For some reason, I looked back towards the house and saw another man standing in the backyard doorway. That's when I ran. I didn't stop to look back, and I didn't want to know if they were following me. After running for what felt like forever, I stopped to see no one was behind me. Realizing I was alone in the woods as the sun was setting and possibly being chased was terrifying. Thankfully, my phone worked, and I used it to navigate back to my hotel without any more issues. As soon as I got back, I searched online for information about the house and found out it had been empty for three years. I checked the original Facebook Marketplace listing I had replied to, but it had been removed. I thought about calling the police but decided against it, thinking they wouldn't be able to do much. I guessed the men were probably homeless and up to something no good. Regardless, the entire experience was deeply unsettling. When I was around 22 years old, I was not feeling well in my mind, felt very alone, and was desperately looking for friends. I had a big problem with eating too much food, especially ordering a lot of food late at night. One evening, I decided to order a pizza. The man who brought it to me was probably between 35 and 45 years old, while I was about 19 or 20. We didn't talk much, just the usual chat you have when someone delivers your pizza. He might have said something nice about my look or clothes, but I can't really remember. This happened many years ago, but I'm sure there was nothing in our talk that showed I wanted to be his friend. It was just a simple talk between a customer and a delivery guy. A day or two later, he sent me a friend request on Facebook. It took me a while to remember who he was. Then I realized he used my order details to find me. Because I was feeling bad, alone, and really wanted friends, I accepted his request. He left some very strange and too personal comments on some of my Facebook pictures, but we never met or talked again, and I think I removed him a few months later. I can't remember well, but I knew it was strange. So, to the odd pizza delivery man who was almost twice my age and decided to find me on Facebook after we barely spoke, I hope we never meet again. And if you did this to someone else, I hope they were smarter and feeling better than I was. Looking back, I should have told the pizza place about him. I've had many delivery drivers try to flirt with me in a weird way since then, and I don't like it. I just want to eat my food without any trouble. I used to deliver food myself, and unless you have a pet, let's keep it quick and polite, and remember to tip your drivers, unless they act inappropriately. This scary thing happened to me around five years back when I was just 18 years old. I had just finished high school and decided to take a break from my boyfriend of many years. 
He was two years older and liked to control everything, which I couldn't stand any longer. Most days I spent time with my friend, let's call her Lisa, just chilling and smoking, enjoying life in a simple way. To give you a picture, I'm quite short and was quite attractive back then. I was fit and cared about my looks. Now I'm just a laid back mom. Sometimes I'd get weird messages on Facebook from guys I didn't know, complimenting my looks and wanting to go out with me. One day, while I was at another friend's place named Jack, I got a message from a guy named Mike, who said he was a model for a fancy brand. Mike was really fit, the kind of guy who would stand outside the store without a shirt. Not really my type, but I won't lie, talking to a handsome guy wasn't a bad thing. His message was different, not like the straightforward ones from other guys. He asked if we had met before because I looked familiar. To me, getting attention like this was a nice boost to my mood, even though I wasn't looking for any guy to date. I replied that I didn't think we had met. He said maybe he saw me at a party because my face seemed familiar and he thought I was very beautiful. We thanked each other and started talking about where we were from, our past relationships and stuff like that. I was really into cars back then, a passion I got from my family who all worked with cars, and I shared with him what my dream car was. He seemed okay and kind of normal at first. Eventually he invited me over to his place which was in a fancy area. So I decided, why not go? I wasn't busy with anything important anyway. I arrived at his place at 8pm during a freezing winter night. He welcomed me at the door and led me to a room that seemed to be his office but it looked very messy. On his computer, he had a video ready to show me, just a car speeding. I thought it was odd, but pretended to be interested. Then, he suggested we watch a movie together. Although I felt something was off about him, I stayed because I was somehow overlooking the warning signs, maybe because he was attractive. After the movie, I left his house, and he texted me immediately, asking me to let him know when I got home. I told him I was home safe and tried to end the conversation, but he kept it going. What are you up to tomorrow? He texted. I've got nothing planned after school, I replied. Do you want to go out for dinner? He suggested. I agreed, thinking it might be better than the first visit. That evening, we went to a diner in his old car. The place was packed, so we waited for our table while he constantly checked his phone, seemingly waiting for a message. Suddenly his phone rang, and he briefly talked about being on a date, referring to me, before hanging up. Throughout the dinner, I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling I had about him. He seemed to be in a rush with everything concerning me, which made me uncomfortable. I just wanted the night to end and to forget about him. After dinner, he drove us back to his place and asked if I wanted to come inside again. I'm really sorry, but I need to head home, I told him. It's late and I'm tired. He seemed disappointed but insisted, Come on, just for a minute, I want to show you something interesting. Despite feeling uneasy, my curiosity got the better of me, and I agreed to step inside. Right away we were met by his parents. It was as if they had been waiting just behind the door for us. Oh, hello. Is this the girl you've been talking about so much? His mom asked. I was shocked. I'd only met him a couple of days ago, and he was already discussing me with his parents? Yeah, she's really special, he replied. His dad suggested, you two have fun. Oh, and look at his swimming photos over there. He's quite the swimmer. Trying to be polite, I quickly greeted them and thought about making a quick exit. But before I could leave, he started sharing his dreams with me, talking about wanting to join the FBI and also model for a clothing brand. His ambitions sounded more like fantasies. I really need to go now, I insisted. I... He walked me to my car awkwardly lingering as if expecting a kiss. But I just hopped into my car, waved goodbye, and drove off, relieved to be leaving. Chadley was odd, and I had no interest in him. But things didn't end there. Over the next few days, Chadley bombarded me with texts. Each day it was the same hey. At first I replied out of politeness, but as I was planning a trip to Florida, I had a reason to avoid meeting him. Despite this, he didn't stop messaging me. My replies grew shorter until I stopped responding altogether. However, that didn't deter him. He continued texting me daily for two months until I finally blocked his number. Then the calls started. Random numbers, private callers, incessantly. Sometimes silence greeted me. Other times I could hear Chadley in the background. 
I stopped answering calls altogether. But then, he shifted to Facebook, sending endless messages with just, Hey. The situation escalated from annoying to deeply unsettling. Constantly, Chadley would send me just hey after hey, pushing my patience to its limit. I had enough and blocked him once more, thinking that would be the end of it. But I was mistaken. Two years passed, and I was happily involved with someone else when suddenly, a Facebook message popped up from Chadley. My heart sank as I read, Hey stranger, how have you been? Ignoring him seemed like the best response, until he sent another message, now insulting me for not replying. His words shocked me. And then, almost as if on cue, my phone beeped with a text from him. Hey! I couldn't believe his audacity. I replied sharply, telling him to leave me alone, and blocked him again, hoping that this time it would be the last. I thought that was the end of my encounters with Chadley. But the story didn't stop there. One day, while hanging out with my friend, let's call her Anna, she was showing me a message on her Facebook when I noticed Chadley's name. He had sent her the same line. Hey, you look really familiar. Have we met before? It was like a bad joke repeating itself. Anna mentioned how Chadley had tried to convince her to visit his house, but she refused because he just wasn't appealing to her. This incident made me curious about how many others had similar experiences with him. A year later, I started a new job and recognized an employee as the sister of Chadley's ex-girlfriend. We got talking, and my curiosity got the better of me. I asked about Chadley. Her story was a chilling echo of my own experiences. He had become obsessed with her sister after just a month of dating, following their breakup with years of stalking. He even confronted her at her new boyfriend's place, causing a scene. Chadley's pattern of behavior was clear and deeply unsettling. So to the creepy stalker Chadley, my message is simple. Please never contact me again. Ever. A couple of weeks ago, something strange happened. You might have heard that Facebook added a way to meet new people for dates. I found a man who seemed nice enough. He was a bit older than me. He said he was 27, and I had just celebrated my 23rd birthday. To me, being four years apart didn't seem like a big deal. We talked for a day or so and then decided to meet for a drink, to see if we clicked in real life. But when I saw him, he looked older than 27. His beard had a lot of gray in it, but I thought maybe he just started going gray early. It happens, right? We sat down, had a few drinks, and talked. He told me again he was 27. He was really friendly, but he kept looking at me in a way that made me feel uneasy. He kept saying nice things about me, which was kind, but it made me feel awkward. I don't think I'm anything special to look at. I was flattered, but also a bit uncomfortable with all the attention. After a while, I decided it was time to go home since I had to wake up at 4.30 a.m. for work the next morning. He walked me to my car, and then we started talking about his car. His car was quite noticeable. A 1970 Camaro. It was out of the blue when he suggested we go for a drive in it at 10 p.m. I said no because it was late, and I had only met this man for a short time. He wanted me to go on a late-night drive with him, which I found very risky. I love watching documentaries about killers and reading scary stories. The last thing I would do is get into a car with a man I barely know. It could be very dangerous, and I was not going to take that chance. He kept asking me to go, but I stayed firm and left in my car. My home was about 45 minutes away. When I got home, I found many messages from him. He said he missed me a lot, wanted to have a future with me, and had never felt this way so quickly at his age of 38. Then, he gave me more compliments. That's when I felt a cold feeling. He just said he was 38 years old. This was different from what he told me before. I asked him if the age difference of 15 years didn't bother him because it definitely bothered me. He said it didn't matter to him, and that he liked younger women. I did not reply, and went to sleep. The next morning I saw he had sent many texts, missed calls, and voicemails. I decided not to talk to him anymore. I blocked him on all social media and his phone number. Maybe it was not nice of me, but he made me feel very uncomfortable. He seemed nice, but was too forceful, reminding me of some scary stories I've heard. So, thanks to Facebook for this scary experience. I guess I won't be using Facebook to meet anyone new again. About four weeks ago, a stranger sent me a friend request on Facebook. We shared several mutual friends, 
so I assumed we might have met at some point, but I had forgotten about him. Without giving it much thought, I accepted his request. Almost immediately after, he tried to video call me through Facebook Messenger. I didn't pick up. He tried a few times, but eventually stopped. Then last week, I received a call from a number I didn't recognize. I answered, thinking it could be about a job I applied for. Hey, how's it going? A cheerful voice asked, saying my name perfectly. My name is quite unique and hard to pronounce just by looking at it, so it struck me as odd that he got it right. When I inquired who he was, it turned out to be the same guy from Facebook. I pretended he had the wrong number by saying he got my name wrong. But then, he bombarded me with personal questions, where I lived, which school I attended. I told him repeatedly that I wasn't comfortable answering, but he wouldn't stop, so I hung up. He called again the next day, but I hung up as soon as I recognized his voice. I decided if he called once more, I'd block him. What freaked me out the most was that my Facebook doesn't list any personal info, especially not my phone number, and I couldn't imagine any of our mutual friends sharing my number with him. How he got it, I have no clue. The whole situation just felt very creepy to me. I had just moved into a new place by myself. After finishing school, I didn't have much money, so my apartment was pretty empty. I only had a few things from my parents' place. It felt good to finally have my own space, but I really needed some basic furniture. Since I didn't have much cash, I decided to look on Facebook Marketplace for free stuff. Looking for furniture there can be tough. A lot of the items are in bad shape, held together with tape. I couldn't afford to be too choosy, but I still hoped to find something that would last a bit. After searching for a long time, I decided to refresh the page. Right away, I saw a new post for a brand new couch, free for pickup. It hadn't been listed for even a minute. I messaged the seller immediately, hoping I could get it. They replied super fast, saying I could have it if I picked it up that night after 9 p.m. The timing was odd to me. It was only noon, and they wanted me to come after dark. But I figured they must be busy until then. So, I agreed and waited until it was time to go. When it was time to leave, I texted the seller I was on my way and put their address in my GPS. It showed they lived far out, in a very remote area. I'm used to living near the mountains, where there aren't many people around. But this was way beyond that. As I drove, the houses became fewer and farther between. The journey felt longer and lonelier as I went further into the less populated areas. The sun had set and the darkness made everything seem more eerie. I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease as I continued driving, the road stretching out into the night ahead of me. Finally, I arrived at a house that looked okay, but it was really far from any other people. I was surprised I still had phone signal, so I sent a message to the seller telling them I had arrived. Almost immediately, I got a short reply saying, okay. I took that as my cue to go to the door. When I knocked, a voice from just behind the door told me it was open and to come in. The voice sounded so close, as if the person was right there. I hesitated, then pushed the door open just a bit to look inside. The house was completely dark, not a single light on anywhere. This was back before phones had built-in flashlights, so all I had was a bit of moonlight coming through a window. I called out a greeting and heard a reply from an open door to my left, leading down to a basement. The person said the couch was down there, ready to go. That really scared me. I said I had to leave and didn't go any further. I turned around, opened the front door wide, and ran to my car. I locked the doors as soon as I got inside and took one last look at the house. Nobody followed me, but I saw the shapes of four men watching me from a window. I drove away fast and didn't stop until I got back to my apartment. Once home, I checked my phone and saw three new messages from the seller. The first asked why I ran off, the second asked if I still wanted the couch, but the third message really scared me. It just said, you're lucky. That night was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I've never used Facebook Marketplace or anything like it since then. I believe those men never planned to give me a couch. My wife and I were on the hunt for a second-hand car on Facebook Marketplace when we stumbled upon an offer that seemed too good to pass up. Excited, we immediately messaged the seller to express our interest. The person selling the car appeared quite friendly through messages, 
and we decided to meet up in a well-known shopping center parking area. He mentioned he'd be free after his work at 5 p.m., so we planned to meet at 5.30 p.m. When 5.30 p.m. rolled around, we were already there, waiting, and informed the seller of our location. Shortly after, we received a message from him stating he was delayed. We weren't in a rush, thinking the delay wouldn't be more than half an hour. We thought it best to use the waiting time to grab something to eat inside the shopping center. However, time ticked away, and after two hours, our patience was wearing thin. Finally, a message came in from the seller promising he'd be there soon. Since it was late autumn, darkness was quickly falling, and with it, our concern grew that the shopping center would soon empty out. Not long after, the seller asked us to meet him at a different location, a more secluded area of the town about 30 minutes away. The place was a gas station near the highway. What struck me was its operating hours. It wasn't open 24 seven, and it had already closed for the day. My wife voiced her worries about the numerous warning signs we were encountering. However, my focus was solely on the car and the deal we thought was a steal. Ignoring our instincts, we replied that we'd be there shortly and left the shopping center, heading toward the gas station. Upon arrival, we were greeted by the sight of an almost deserted parking lot with barely any cars around. Within a minute, my wife spotted the car we were there to see. As we got closer, the car's shape became clearer, but it looked nothing like what we had seen in the bright photos on Facebook Marketplace. This car was parked in a very dim area of the lot, pushed far back into the shadows. I steered our car towards it, and my wife gave me a puzzled look. But I was sure I had seen something odd on the ground. I stepped out to get a better look, and there it was. A spike strip laid out right on the path we'd need to take to get closer to the car. That moment, a chill ran down my spine realizing this was a trap. Without wasting a second, I jumped back into our car, reversed, and drove away as fast as I could, leaving the eerie gas station behind us. Once we were safely home, I wasted no time in calling the police to report what had happened. But since we hadn't seen anyone or anything else suspicious, all I could provide was the information about the car ad. The ad disappeared from Facebook Marketplace a few days after I reported it, but that was all I ever knew. The police never got back to me, leaving me clueless if they ever caught the person behind it. This whole ordeal taught me to be much more careful and skeptical about deals that seemed too good to be true, especially on platforms like Facebook Marketplace. The scare we had that night lingered with us, turning every online deal into a question of safety rather than just value. Four months back, we moved to a new house in the countryside. Living in an apartment before, we didn't own a lawnmower. Buying a new one for $200 seemed too much, especially since we might move again in a few years. So, we thought of hiring someone to mow our lawn. At first, we hired a man my partner knew from work, but paying him $65 every two weeks was getting expensive. That's when I found Mike. Mike had advertised on my Facebook that he was available to mow lawns over the weekend. He claimed to have a good business. I messaged him on Facebook. Mike seemed friendly at first. He asked for my address to give me a price quote. After visiting, he texted, Wow, buddy, your front yard is huge. His comment made me uneasy but I thought I was just being sensitive. We started to arrange when he could come by. I shared my off days with him, but he said I didn't need to be there when he worked. I suggested Wednesday might work. On Wednesday morning, he texted me, are you at home? I replied, no. Three hours later, back home yet? I said no again, explaining I'd be late. Mike then said he had a flat tire and would come the next day. Thursday came and early in the morning, he texted again. Will you be in today? I said no. He texted a few hours later, asking the same. I reminded him I wouldn't be in all day and asked if he was still coming. Then he said his truck broke down. His messages were like, please don't be mad, buddy. I was getting annoyed and a bit scared by all his excuses, but I told him to try the next day. It's Saturday now. After work around four or five, I checked my phone and saw many messages from him. He said he mowed the lawn and demanded I pay him. I refused, saying I'd pay through Cash App. He got very angry, insisting on being paid immediately. I said I'd pay after seeing the lawn myself. Honestly, I feared he might be at my home waiting. So I had a friend follow me home. Thankfully, 
he wasn't there. I paid him, hoping that was the end. Two months later, alking to my partner while driving to school, he suddenly said he had to hang up because someone was in our driveway. Confused, I asked for details. He mentioned a strange man wandering our property. Later, he texted it was a man advertising his lawn service. When I got home that night, I found a business card with the same name as the man who'd been texting me. I called my partner, asking about the man's behavior. He mentioned the man seemed shocked to see a man answer and inquired if he lived alone. My partner hadn't seen him stop at any other homes. The man, desperate to help, offered various services and oddly asked about pests, specifically bats, which we did have, and I had posted about on Facebook. He also acted strangely about our dog, Max, asking many questions about his size and habits, which seemed more about fear than curiosity. After a brief exterior tour, the man left. Realizing this was the same man from before, my partner got worried. The man had asked detailed questions about our household. Before he left, my partner inquired if he had mowed our lawn before, suspecting a mix-up with the previous owners, but the man denied ever doing so, claiming he was just promoting his business. The worrying part was that my car was in the driveway that day, suggesting to him I was home alone. I hesitated to call the police, thinking I might be overreacting. This happened just two days ago. I hope not to hear from him again, but I'll update if anything happens. My father loved playing the guitar more than anything. It was what he was best at, and music filled his life from morning till night. He earned his money by joining different music groups around the town of Pineville, and nobody could play country music on the guitar like he could. I might sound a bit odd saying it, but my dad was from a small town in Georgia, and he brought all of that country feel with him when he moved up north with my mom. As a teenager, I was into heavy metal music. I would travel to see live bands play in the city, but it was my dad who made me appreciate country music. However, living the life of a musician meant that we often struggled with money, and there was a time when we were so broke that we almost lost our house. We tried to save as much as we could, my mom worked extra hours, and my dad even found a job serving drinks in a bar, but our money was still not enough. My dad's most prized possession was this very old guitar from a brand called Martin. He used to say that, just like certain foods and drinks, guitars sound better as they get older. This guitar had a special sound, full of depth and warmth. I can't quite explain it, but there was something magical about the sounds that came from that guitar, and my dad loved it deeply. But, despite how much he cherished it, we were in such a bad financial situation that selling the guitar seemed like the only option to keep us afloat. So, with a heavy heart, my dad sold his beloved Martin for a good amount of money. After selling the guitar, our luck started to change for the better. After a lot of hard work, we managed to save our home. My dad started to play music again, and my mom got a better job. It took us around two years, but slowly, we got back to a normal life. But then, my dad began to suffer from terrible headaches. At first, we thought it was because he was working too much, trying hard to provide for us, but the pain got worse, and he finally decided to see a doctor. Just when things were starting to look better for us, disaster struck. The doctor told my dad he had a brain tumor, and it was very serious. The doctor said my dad had only two months to organize his things. When he died, I felt lost without him. I wanted to find his old Martin guitar. I thought having it back would make me feel closer to him. But my mom didn't know who he sold it to. My dad didn't keep track of things like that. It was hard, but I had to accept that I might never see the guitar again. Losing hope and finding it became a part of dealing with my sadness. Years later, I was trying to make it as a musician in Detroit. One night, me and some friends were out drinking and ended up talking to a woman who said she was a psychic. We didn't take her seriously at first. We thought she was just trying to get a free drink by pretending to tell us our futures. But she wasn't like the fake psychics. She truly believed she could tell us about ourselves. She told one of my friends that he would cause a lot of pain, more than we could ever forgive. We laughed it off because he was the gentlest among us. To keep the fun going, I asked her to tell me about my future. She looked at me closely and then said, What you're searching for is already with you, in your pocket. I checked my pockets. 
All I had were my keys, my phone, and a pack of cigarettes. There was nothing special or lost that I was looking for. The next day I woke up with a terrible headache, feeling worse than ever. I stayed in bed for a long while that morning, just scrolling through my phone, looking at pictures from last night, trying to ignore how sick I felt. Then on a whim, I opened the Facebook marketplace. I wasn't looking for anything in particular, just killing time. But as I browsed through musical instruments for sale, my heart nearly stopped. There was a guitar listed that looked exactly like the one my dad used to own. As I examined the pictures, every scratch and mark on it seemed to whisper, this was your dad's. Even the case looked familiar. It felt like a punch in the gut. The seller was asking for a lot of money, way more than I had. But I managed to talk him into letting me pay in installments. It was too important. It felt like bringing a piece of my dad back home. When I played my dad's songs on that guitar, it was like he was right there with us. My mom cried the first time she heard it. Now you might wonder where the horror in this story is. It might seem like the encounter with the psychic was just a weird coincidence. After all, my friend didn't become a violent person, did he? Well, it's not that simple. Around the time I got the guitar back, my friend had an accident at work. He started taking prescription painkillers and changed a lot after that. In the months that followed, he lost weight, missed work, and money began to disappear from his and his wife's accounts. Then, their valuable things started to go missing. We didn't want to believe it, but he had become addicted to the painkillers. Eventually, he did exactly what the psychic predicted. He hurt everyone close to him. His wife kicked him out, and I had to do the same when he stole from me. The last I heard, he was in trouble with the law because his girlfriend had overdosed, and he left her outside a hospital where she died. That psychic's words haunted me. What she said about my friend was shockingly accurate. I had always thought he was too kind to hurt anyone. I didn't realize that the psychic's warning could come true in such a tragic way. I don't believe in supernatural things. But that night, a psychic told us what would happen. And somehow, it all came true. I'm a person who often visits secondhand shops and sometimes pawn shops as well. Finding bargains and saving money is something I enjoy. Over the years, by buying used items, I've managed to save a good amount of money. From time to time, I also check out deals on Facebook Marketplace. There are always interesting things for sale there. Most items I see, I don't really want or need, so I don't bother buying them. But now and then, I stumble upon an offer that's too tempting to ignore. This tale began around half a year ago. Until then, I had bought maybe three or four items through Facebook Marketplace and all those times went smoothly. One day, as I was scrolling through the listings, I noticed an iPhone for sale. It was a model two versions newer than mine and was being sold for a really good price. It was unlocked too, which meant I could use it with any network as long as I had a SIM card. I was actually in need of a new phone and this one seemed perfect, no visible damage and described as almost new. Plus, it was a fresh listing, which got me even more excited. I decided to act quickly and messaged the seller, who replied pretty fast. He was a guy living not too far from me. Eager to get the phone, I told him I could meet whenever it was convenient for him. We agreed to meet the following day at a Target store close to where both of us lived. It was the largest and most well-known store around our area. Filled with excitement about my soon-to-be new phone, I drove to Target the next day, money in hand, thinking about the great deal I was getting. I arrived about 10 minutes early and decided to go inside and look around Target as I waited. As the meeting time approached, I let the seller know through a message that I was already inside Target, looking around but couldn't spot him anywhere. Then, after waiting for what felt like forever, about 10 more minutes, he finally replied. He said sorry because something urgent had popped up and he couldn't make it to our meeting. I felt a bit let down but replied, it's okay, maybe we could try again tomorrow. After that, I didn't feel like staying in Target anymore, so I left without buying anything. When I got back to my car and started driving home, I noticed a blue four-door sedan following me. The thought crossed my mind that it could be the seller, maybe trying to scare me or something worse. I know it sounds like I'm too suspicious, but when dealing with strangers from Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, it's hard not to worry about these things. I couldn't see clearly who was driving the car behind me, but it seemed to be a man. Not wanting him to follow me all the way to my place, 
I decided to stop on the side of the road. This road usually has a lot of cars coming and going, and at first the blue sedan seemed to slow down to stop as well. But when I completely stopped, the car suddenly moved back onto the road and sped away. I tried to get a good look at the driver as he passed, but I couldn't see much. After the sedan was gone from my sight, I waited a little longer before getting back on the road to continue my drive home. As soon as I got home and settled in, I couldn't help but peek out the window. To my unease, I saw the same blue sedan driving very slowly down my street. I quickly ducked to avoid being seen. The car went past my house, disappeared for a moment, and then I saw it again, driving back in the opposite direction. It didn't stop near my house or anything, but it was definitely moving at a snail's pace. I just hoped the driver didn't know where I lived. Right then, I decided to block the seller on Facebook. The phone was no longer something I wanted. To this day, I'm not completely sure if the person in the sedan was the seller or someone else, but my gut tells me it was him. I don't think he knows exactly where I live, but somehow, he must have figured out my street. Thankfully, nothing more happened after that night, and everything has been normal since then. In 2018, the world saw the release of a new gaming console, the PlayStation 5, which was a big deal because it could show games in really good quality. This story takes place a bit before that, when people were just starting to sell things on a website called Facebook Marketplace. I had an older gaming console, a PlayStation 4, that I didn't need anymore because I had gotten the new one. I decided to sell my old PlayStation on Facebook Marketplace. It seemed like the easiest way since I didn't want to bother setting up an account on another selling site. Little did I know, this decision would lead to one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I put up an ad for my old PlayStation, asking for $100 which I thought was fair, and waited for someone to be interested. The internet of course sent me some strange people. Some said they would only pay me $30 and asked if I could bring it to their house, even if they lived really far away. Most of the messages I got weren't serious, which I kind of expected. My PlayStation was old and I doubted I'd get much for it. But then, I got a message from a mother. She said her son was very sick and asked if I could lower the price for them. The message she sent was long and sad. It was about her 10-year-old son who had a serious illness, one I'd never heard of. I looked it up online, and it was real, with some scary symptoms. At first I thought it was just a sad story, but as we kept messaging, I understood how much my old game console could mean to her family. I started to really care about making this boy's Christmas special. After a few days of talking with the mother, I decided to just give her the PlayStation for free. I didn't really need the money, and I thought about how happy it would make them. I was so into this idea that I even bought special packaging to send it off. I wanted to make this kid's Christmas unforgettable. It made me feel good about myself, which is probably why I didn't want to believe it when things started to get weird. When it was time to get the mother's address, I noticed some things didn't add up, but I didn't think much of it at first. For example, she first told me she lived at one address, then she changed it when I asked again to make sure. When I asked her why she changed the address, she explained she was in a place where people often took packages that weren't theirs. She didn't want the PlayStation to get stolen, so she gave me her friend's address instead, someone who could give it to her safely. It sounded like a good reason. She was a mom on her own, trying to make it in a tough area, and I was just trying to help. Maybe I should have seen that something was wrong, but I was too caught up in feeling good about what I was doing. What really started to make me wonder was when she talked about her child's medical treatment starting. She said it was supposed to start the same day I was going to send the PlayStation. I had everything ready to go. The console, the controllers, all the cables, and some games that a kid would like. I thought she must be really stressed with her child going through all these doctor visits, and sending the PlayStation that day might bring her some happiness. I couldn't keep it a secret and wanted to feel good about my kindness. So I messaged her, sending the package today, just making sure I've got the right place. She replied, you've just made my day. You're so kind. Feeling proud, I said, hope it gets to you without any trouble. Then she said, this is perfect because Franklin starts his treatment next month. Next month. I looked back at our messages and she had said the treatment was starting on the 25th the same day we were messaging. Confused, I mentioned, 
I thought his treatment was starting today. She said no, it was next month, as if she hadn't told me the 25th before. When I brought up the previous date she mentioned, she just said, Oh, we had to change the dates, sorry for not telling you. But something felt off, so I asked if she was hiding something. Of course, she said no, but I suggested we talk over the phone instead. She picked up, proving she was real and sounded busy, maybe a bit annoyed, so I thought maybe I had called at a bad time. If she hadn't made a big mistake, everything might have been fine. As we were about to hang up, she said, Freddy will love the PlayStation. Freddy? All week she had been calling her son Franklin, and now suddenly it was Freddy. This wasn't something autocorrect could mess up. We were talking on the phone. I called her back, confronting her mistake. I wasn't completely sure what was going on, but I acted as if I knew something was wrong. I told her I knew she was lying and that I would tell the police about her. At first, she tried to deny everything weakly, but as I kept saying she was lying, she got very angry. Suddenly, she was no longer pretending to be a kind mother. She became very mean, telling me I was foolish for believing her story. She insulted me, saying I was naive for wanting to help a sick child. She laughed at me, calling me a fool and said people like me were easy targets for people like her. I stayed calm and told her I would tell Facebook and the police about her, and I would share her profile with many people to warn them she was tricking others. Of course, her profile was fake. She bragged that she had many more, but she knew a lot about me because I had shared real information about myself. She knew what I looked like, where I lived, and she made very scary threats against me and my family. I was especially worried because I had listed my sister and cousin on my profile as family. I felt very stupid for making it easy for her to know about my family. She said the police wouldn't be able to do anything to her. If they tried, she threatened to have her boyfriend hurt my family. I didn't know if she would really do it, but just the fact that she could see their profiles made me very scared. I thought if anything happened to them because of me, I would never forgive myself. I ended up blocking her and warning my family. I told my sister and cousin to make their profiles private and explained the whole situation. I was worried the scammer might use our pictures for another fake profile. This was the scariest thing that ever happened to me online. Now, I am very careful when talking to strangers on the internet, and I tell everyone to be the same way. My wife really wanted to celebrate her 31st birthday by attending a concert of her most loved country singer, who was touring during the summer. The prices for the tickets shocked me, as they were more than $200 even for not-so-good seats. I'm not a big fan of going to concerts, so this took me by surprise. I thought it would be less expensive. But I was determined to make her happy, so I was thrilled to find out the tour would stop near where she grew up. It seemed like the perfect present for her. The tickets were set to go on sale on a Tuesday, and because I had work, I planned to buy them online afterward. However, due to my lack of experience with concerts, I didn't know tickets could sell out so fast. By the time I got home from work, there were none left. I felt so disappointed. Talking to a friend, he suggested looking for tickets on the secondary market, though he warned they might be more expensive. Still, I was hopeful. I started looking on popular websites like StubHub and Vivid Seats, but didn't find much. So I turned to Craigslist and Facebook, hoping maybe someone local was selling tickets. I messaged a few sellers, but either got no reply or they would ask for more money each time we talked. Weeks passed, and I was about to give up hope when I stumbled upon an ad on Facebook Marketplace. A guy named Victor was selling two tickets at a price that didn't seem too high. I quickly messaged him, hoping the tickets were still available. After waiting for a while with no response, I went to bed feeling down thinking I had missed my chance. To my surprise, the next morning as I was getting ready for work, I saw a message from Victor. He had replied at around 4 a.m., telling me the tickets were still up for grabs. I was overjoyed and asked him how I could get the tickets. He mentioned he had other people interested, so I needed to pay him through PayPal first, then we could arrange a pickup. Victor agreed to use PayPal's goods and services option, which made me feel a bit safer about the transaction. I sent the money, and he confirmed receiving it. He offered to send the tickets digitally or meet up to hand over physical tickets. Since it was a gift for my wife, I chose the physical ones. We decided to meet at a local grocery store at around 8 p.m. for me to pick up the tickets. I arrived a bit before the time we had agreed on, 
and found a spot to park at the far left of the lot, just like we had planned. Nearly an hour later, I saw an old, beaten-up car, a Marine Oldsmobile, pull in and park a few cars away from me. Unsure if it was Victor, I decided to wait. After around five minutes, the person in the car finally opened the door, so I took a chance and called out, Hey, are you Victor? The person replied with a simple, Yes. He then said, Hi, thank you for buying these from me. Here are your tickets. We made small talk for a little while. I told him the tickets were for my wife's birthday, and then we said goodbye to each other. I put the tickets in a box and gave them to my wife on her birthday. She was thrilled, and we both looked forward to the concert, which was just a few weeks away. The concert day was fantastic. We got great seats, enjoyed some drinks, and were having a wonderful time. But then, during one of the opening acts, someone tapped my shoulder and said, Hey, great to see you. To my surprise, it was Victor. I greeted him, a bit confused, and he mentioned something about traffic being bad. He then introduced himself to my wife, acting as if it was a big deal that she could make it. My wife, a bit taken aback, asked me quietly who he was. I explained he was the guy from whom I had bought the tickets, and that I hadn't expected him to be here too. Victor was friendly, but as the night went on, his behavior grew odd. He acted as if we had planned to come together, like we were a group of friends. This confused both me and my wife. Though I tried to keep the conversation light and focus on the show, Victor's remarks about us being together were unsettling. Each time he said something like that, I would just nod and smile, not wanting to make a scene. Despite this weirdness, my wife was enjoying the concert, and that was what mattered to me. But as the night was ending, Victor leaned over and asked what our plans were for the rest of the evening. I was straightforward with him, saying we appreciated the tickets, but were heading home. As we got up to leave, Victor grabbed my arm. I reacted with frustration, telling him I didn't know him and wanted him to leave us alone. Although I felt bad for snapping at him, I was relieved when we finally walked away. The following weeks were normal, but that night at the concert remained a strange memory. After that night, life went back to its busy rhythm for both of us. Work piled up, and so did the chores at home. One evening, while trying to fall asleep early, my phone buzzed with a Facebook notification. It was a message from Victor, saying he enjoyed the concert with us and wanted to get to know us better. I was disturbed by his message. Without a second thought, I deleted it and blocked him. This was exactly why I disliked using social media. Too many strange encounters. Though Victor's message bothered me for a while, it eventually started to fade from my thoughts as days passed. Several weeks later, my wife and I were relaxing at home when suddenly our dogs erupted into barking frenzy due to loud knocks at the door. We usually don't have visitors, especially because our old Akita isn't too fond of strangers. I decided to check who it was through the garage, leaving my wife in the living room. My heart dropped when I saw it was Victor. I was shocked and could barely ask what he was doing at my house. He awkwardly explained he had tickets for another show and thought we might be interested. His smile was unsettling. I demanded to know how he found where I lived. He mentioned the PayPal transaction. I warned him sternly to never come near my family again, or he'd have to deal with the police and our protective dogs. His smile faded, and he left with a troubling remark. I took a moment outside to calm down before going back in. My wife asked who was at the door and I lied, saying it was just a delivery. For weeks afterward, I felt uneasy. The motion sensor lights outside would trigger more often than usual, and I thought I heard strange sounds around the house. I convinced myself it was just my nerves, but the fear of Victor's unexpected visit lingered. Although we haven't seen Victor since that day, the experience has left a lasting impact. I've sworn off buying anything from Facebook to avoid any chance of another encounter like that. A short time back, I stumbled upon a post on Facebook Marketplace where a lady was offering free hamsters. She had a male and female hamster that ended up having a lot of babies. She said it was too much for her to handle, so she wanted to give them away for free to people who would take good care of them. The post didn't mention the sad fact that the hamster mom might eat her babies if she felt she couldn't care for them, but I knew about this and decided to contact her. The lady, a widow, had bought the hamsters for company after her husband passed away. 
I found it odd she didn't get a cat or dog instead since they're more common pets for companionship. But I figured everyone has their preferences. She sounded very kind on the phone when we arranged a time for me to come and pick up a couple of the baby hamsters. I certainly didn't expect what I found when my dad and I arrived at her house with a small cage lined with straw to take the hamsters home. The visit quickly took a dark turn. We rang the bell at the lady's house, but no one answered at first. When she finally opened the door, it was clear she wasn't well. One of her eyes was swollen, red, and leaking some yellow stuff. We didn't say anything about it, not wanting to make her feel bad or embarrassed. As soon as she let us in, we understood possibly why she was ill. Her house smelled terrible, worse than anything I'd ever smelled, and there were hamsters everywhere, and I mean everywhere. The hamsters, like their owner, looked sick. Just in the kitchen, I saw many of them with bald spots or strange bumps on their bodies. Then she took us to her living room to offer us tea, and it was even more shocking there. Right away, me and my dad knew we had to leave fast after giving each other a look that screamed, Let's get out of here! The house was full of hamster droppings everywhere you looked, which made it clear why the lady was sick. Seeing a tiny hamster skeleton tucked behind a curtain was the last straw for me. I quickly made up an excuse, telling my dad loudly that we forgot to buy something essential for the hamsters back at the store. Nodding in agreement, we said we couldn't possibly take the hamsters home without this item and promised to return in a few days. Sitting in the car afterwards, we were both stunned. It was sad and scary to think someone lived like that, all alone, with no one checking on her. The house was a disaster, and it was clear the lady needed help. We felt bad, like we were tattling on her, but we knew we had to do something, so we called the animal rescue. The person from the ASPCA told us they would look into it and get back to us. Eventually, they thanked us for letting them know. Thanks to our call, the lady got connected with a charity that would look after her as she got older. Her home was much cleaner and safer after the rescue team removed nearly a hundred hamsters. They told us that if it weren't for the neighborhood cats, the problem could have been much worse. I remembered seeing cats around her house and thought she was just feeding them because she loved animals, but it turned out she was unknowingly feeding them in a different, more gruesome way. What struck me the most was how normal her house looked from the outside. You'd never guess the horror that was inside. It made me realize we really don't know what's happening behind closed doors, not even with the people living right next to us. It's a scary thought that beneath the surface of everyday life, there can be something completely unexpected and terrifying. Last year, I was trying to sell an old coffee table online. I wanted just $40 for it, which I thought was fair because it was still in decent condition even though it wasn't anything fancy. The table was pretty old, so I thought the price was okay. For a long time, nobody seemed interested in buying it. But after a few weeks, one person finally showed interest. His name was Max. He asked if I could lower the price to $30. I agreed immediately because I just wanted to get rid of it. If nobody bought it, I was planning to give it away to a charity shop. Max asked when he could come to pick it up, and I told him he could come the next evening between 5 and 7 p.m., he said that time worked for him, so I gave him my home address. I was relieved I was going to be rid of the table. I moved the table near my front door the next day so Max could easily take it when he arrived. When it was 5 p.m., I hadn't heard anything from Max, but I thought he'd show up soon. Time passed, and suddenly it was 7 p.m., but there was no sign of Max. I decided to check online to see if he had messaged me, but when I looked, I found out Max had blocked me. This was really strange. We had a good chat before, and I couldn't understand why he would block me. It seemed now he wouldn't be buying the table, so I moved it away from the door. I kept the online ad up, hoping someone else might be interested, but nobody contacted me. About a week later, everything was normal until one evening. I was in my living room, getting ready to go to bed. It was late, around 10 or 11 p.m. Suddenly, I heard a noise at my back door. It sounded like someone was trying to open it. I lived by myself and wasn't expecting anyone and I don't often use the back door. Right away, I felt something was very wrong. I began moving towards the kitchen, which is located at the back part of my house, close to where the back door is. I was about halfway to the kitchen when I suddenly heard the sound of glass shattering. The noise came from the same direction. In that moment, I stopped dead in my tracks, 
then turned around and ran towards the hallway. I sprinted to my bedroom, which had a door that could lock. Once inside, I quickly locked the door behind me. From my room, I could hear strange sounds coming from the kitchen area. It was clear to me that someone had broken into my home. The first thing I did once I was safely in my room was to call the police. I whispered into the phone, trying to make as little noise as possible. While talking to the emergency operator, I could hear someone walking around inside my house. I hid in my closet, trying to be as silent as I could. The operator assured me that the police would arrive soon. After hanging up the phone, the noises in the house stopped. I stayed hidden in the closet, trying not to make any sound, hoping not to hear anything else. After a while, the police got there and entered my house. I didn't come out of my hiding spot until I was completely sure it was safe. By the time I felt secure enough to leave my bedroom and closet, the intruder had disappeared. The police searched the place, but didn't find anyone. However, the broken window and its damage were evident. They searched the area, but never caught the intruder. This incident still scares me. I can't help but suspect that it was Max who broke into my home. After all, I had given him my address just a week before, and his sudden decision to block me was too strange. I shared all the details with the police, including my suspicion about Max, but I never heard back whether they found him or confirmed it was indeed him who broke in. A few years back, my partner and I, now married, decided to sell some things we no longer needed because we had moved to a new place. Among these items was an old, large TV. We posted an ad on eBay and another on Facebook Marketplace, which was quite new back then, and waited to see what offers would come in. My partner believed she had found a good buyer who would come and take the TV from our place, making things easier for us. But I received a message from someone who couldn't pay our full price but offered us a deal we thought was fair. This person was an older man living alone with his dog. His TV had broken, and he couldn't afford a new one. He offered to pay about 70% of our asking price, and said he could offer his plumbing services to cover the rest. I ended up talking a lot with him. He reminded me of an uncle I was fond of, and I felt a connection. He had hit a rough patch through no fault of his own. If anyone deserved a bit of kindness, it was him. After talking it over with my partner, we decided to give him the TV for free, but we knew he might not accept our gift outright. He asked us to wait three weeks before bringing it to his house, saying he needed time to gather the money. We agreed and took down his address, planning to get in touch in a few weeks. Time passed, and one Saturday morning, we decided to deliver the TV to his home. We called him before leaving to let him know we were coming, but he didn't answer. We tried calling a couple more times, but there was still no response. It might seem a bit selfish, but the TV was packed up and cluttering our hallway. So even though we couldn't get in touch with the man, we decided to go to his house anyway, thinking we might leave the TV with one of his neighbors. We thought leaving the TV with a neighbor would also save us from any awkward moments of him trying to pay us, which we didn't want to accept. So, we drove to the man's house with the TV still in our car. We wanted to make sure nobody was there before we decided what to do next. I stepped out of the car, walked up to his house, and knocked on the door, but no one answered. Then, I leaned back to peek through the front window, wondering if maybe he was there but couldn't hear us because he was hard of hearing or something. Looking at the window, I noticed many small black dots on the blinds and window ledge. At first, I thought it was just dirt, but suddenly, one of these dirt pieces moved in that quick way bugs do, and I realized what I was seeing. There were about 50 houseflies, big ones, gathered on his window. It's strange how our brains don't immediately recognize what we're seeing when there are so many flies in one place, compared to just one or two. That moment, I felt a deep sense of horror. It's like deep down, I knew something was terribly wrong. I might have even said, oh god, oh no, out loud as the realization hit me. A bunch of flies like that usually means there's a lot of trash or something dead nearby. And in this case, something dead was the old man we had come to know and like through our talks about the TV. The whole situation turned into a nightmare, from calling the police to them and the fire department arriving to break down his door. When they did, a terrible smell started to fill the street. It was the worst thing I've ever smelled. Even though we hadn't met in person, I felt like I knew the man. He was kind, 
seemed independent, and I believe he was a veteran. This whole thing really upset me. The sight of those flies, so large and feeding, haunted me. They had been living off the man we had been talking to just a few weeks before. The randomness and suddenness of death struck me hard, along with its grim details. The image of the flies on the window stayed with me, almost like they were a part of him left behind. It made me think about how death leaves something behind. But it's often something very unpleasant. Last year, I decided to sell my billiard table on Facebook Marketplace. It was in my basement, not looking too good. I hardly played on it. It took too much room, and I knew it was time for it to go. I put it up for sale on Facebook Marketplace, asking for a bit more money than maybe I should have. I wasn't in a rush to sell it, but I still hoped for a good price. It wasn't an insanely high price, but someone could probably find a better table for less if they really looked. After I listed it, nobody seemed interested in the billiard table. I wasn't surprised, but after several weeks, I finally got a message. A man named Tom was interested, and he quickly said he wanted to buy the billiard table. We chatted for a bit, and then arranged for Tom to come and buy the table. I didn't think I'd actually get my asking price, and expected Tom would want to talk down the price once he saw it. I had in mind the lowest price I'd accept. Tom arrived around 6 p.m. on a weekday, coming straight from work. I greeted him and led him to the basement to see the table. He inspected it for a few minutes and then agreed to pay the full price I had listed. I was stunned when he handed me the full amount in cash. Happily, I accepted it. I told Tom it was all his now, and I helped him get the table into his large truck. It barely fit, and moving the table was tough, but we managed. After he drove off, I felt really good about the sale, never thinking I'd get that much for the table. Almost two weeks passed, and then Tom messaged me, upset, saying he felt cheated and could have found a better deal elsewhere. This was well over a week later, so taking the table back was out of the question. I told him as much, saying a deal's a deal. Tom didn't take this well. He kept insisting I should give him some money back, but I stood my ground. I didn't owe him anything. If he wanted a better deal, he should have negotiated or looked elsewhere. I didn't feel it was my job to make him feel better about his decision. Our conversation ended badly, but I thought that was the end of it. Days passed without a word from Tom, then weird things began to happen. One evening, while my girlfriend and I were having dinner at my place, she suddenly stood up and told me there was a man standing in our front yard. We both went to check, but I didn't see anyone. However, I did notice a white truck parked on the street. It was Tom's truck. I recognized it from when he came to pick up the billiard table. I explained to my girlfriend about Tom being upset over the table's price. We checked all around the house from inside, peering out each window, but we didn't see Tom anywhere. As we were checking, I decided to open the front door to get a better look, and right then, the truck started and drove off. I tried to message Tom to confront him about showing up at my house, but I found out he had blocked me online. Two nights later, the situation escalated. I was alone, watching TV in the living room, when I saw a shadow pass by the front window. Shortly after, someone tried to open my front door, but fortunately it was locked. I didn't hesitate to call the police, but Tom disappeared before they arrived. I explained everything to the officers and hoped that would be the end of it. But the very next morning, as I was heading to my car to go to work, I heard rapid footsteps behind me. Turning around, I saw Tom charging towards me with intense anger. Instead of trying to reach my car, I sprinted back into my house. I managed to get inside just in time, with a tiny lead on Tom. He was furious. First he tried the door, and when he found it locked, he went to bang on a window. I called the police again and this time they arrived quickly enough to catch Tom before he could cause any harm to me or my house. This terrifying incident made me stop using Facebook Marketplace, at least for a while. I've learned it's better not to share your address too freely and to always be cautious with people you meet online. Ending relationships is hard for everyone. Not long back I ended things with my partner of almost 10 years. It felt finished way before that, but I struggle with ending stuff. My partner was very sensitive, and any time I brought up breaking up over the years, well, they just couldn't handle it. 
I didn't see then that dragging it out was making things worse. I should also say to keep everyone safe, I won't share names or places in this story. I still know their family well, and they've been through a lot. I don't want to cause them more trouble. When I finally made the break official, it was as bad as you'd expect. My partner took it really hard, and there was a lot of arguing, tears, and even some scary threats, but in the end we went our separate ways. They went to live with their aunt, maybe an hour's drive away, but I'm not sure exactly. I kept our house and ended up giving them most of our furniture, which was okay with me. I make enough money to buy new stuff. I plan to get new furniture from a big store later, but for a while, I needed something to sit on instead of just a garden chair for watching TV. I looked online for anyone giving away furniture. I found this really ugly yellow two-seater sofa. It sounds bad, but I have a thing for yellow, so I was excited, and the lady selling it only wanted $40 for it, and it looked almost new. I messaged her to set up a time to see the sofa. Her place was about 40 minutes away, which was fine by me. The house was a bit out of the way, kind of hidden. I knocked, and an old woman opened the door. When I mentioned the sofa, she got really scared. She yelled that she didn't know me or what I was talking about and slammed the door shut. Confused, I went back to my car to check the address and my messages. It was definitely the right place. So I messaged the lady again, saying someone had shut the door on me. After a few minutes, she replied, apologizing. She said, Oh no, I'm so sorry, that's my grandma. I stay in the garage out back. Feeling a bit annoyed, but still wanting that sofa, I went around to the back as instructed. I knocked on the garage door and heard a voice, not clear, telling me to enter. Inside, the garage looked ordinary. No sofa in sight. I called out, but no reply came. Just as I decided to leave, a small figure rushed at me from another room, taking me by surprise and knocking me down. It was too dark, and she had something on her head so I couldn't see her face. She was loud and frantic until the cover fell from her head, and to my shock, it was my ex-partner, the last person I expected to see. I pushed her off in disbelief and began to argue instead of running away. She switched from being wild to crying hard. Despite my anger and confusion, I went to calm her down. That's when she pulled out something like a box cutter and cut my shoulder. I yelled in pain, threw the cutter away and started to scream. I had never seen her like this in all the years I knew her. She tried to attack me again but was crying too much to aim properly. I managed to escape to my car and called the police immediately. The police arrived quickly and arrested her. It was terrifying to be attacked and sad to see someone I cared about in such a state. The person in the police car was completely different from the person I once loved. I couldn't believe her plan worked. She must have known I'd look online and be drawn to the ugly yellow sofa. She did move in with her aunt, just a few houses away from the elderly lady's place, where all this happened. My ex-partner was taken for treatment. I chose not to press charges and am even helping with her medical costs. It's shocking how those close to us can hurt us so much. Something in her snapped, and despite everything, I feel sorry for her and hope she gets the help she needs.